Okay, welcome to your next set of notes. This time we're um, taking notes called The Brink of the Civil War. Um, it is kind of a continuation of our last set of notes, The Causes of the Civil War. Um, so we're talking about the era just before America's Deadliest War. Um, so going back a little bit, we're going to talk about the three compromises dealing with slavery. Uh, the first one was back in 1820, and that was the Missouri Compromise. The Missouri Compromise is an 1820 agreement between the North and South that set the boundary of slavery at the southern border of, Mo of Missouri, right here, and extended it west. Okay? It also allowed Missouri to come in as a slave state so that Maine could come in as a free state and the balance um, between free and slave states would stay the same, meaning that one state couldn't outvote the other one in um, the Senate in Washington, D.C. That lasts for quite some time, about 30 years, and then the Compromise of 1850 comes. The Compromise of 1850 allows California to enter the country as a free state, but now the U.S. had to enforce the fugitive slave laws in the North, meaning any runaway slave that was caught now in New York or in Vermont or New Hampshire right, could be brought back into the South right, for justice. Before the North, you know, once you got to the Northern state, you would have been free. After 1850, that's no longer the case. Uh, now they had to go all the way into Canada in order to be free. This is when you start to see you know, a lot of that Underground Railroad uh, stuff that a lot of kids are familiar with. Uh, and keep in mind, guys, with this map, green states are the free states, right? And the orange states here are the slave states. All right. Compromise of 1850 doesn't last all that long because um, by 1854, we have the Kansas-Nebraska Act. This act said that all Western territories will have popular sovereignty meaning that the people will choose if they wanted slavery or not. This really ends up angering a lot of the Northerners because territories out here that were free before now could potentially become slaves or slave states if the people in that territory voted that way. What this really ends up doing is just causing a whole heck of a lot of problems, especially right here in the Kansas Territory when Kansas goes to become a state. Here's a quick little video, guys, about the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Early in 1854, Pierce received a visit from members of his own party, including Illinois Senator Stephen A. Douglas. Douglas informed Pierce he was sponsoring a bill called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The Kansas-Nebraska Act is one of the key moments in all American political history. The act was designed to repeal the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which banned slavery in states above the southern border of Missouri. The intent was to let the new territories of Kansas and Nebraska, both north of the boundary, decide for themselves if they wanted slavery or not. Douglas promised to make Pierce's presidency a living nightmare if Pierce didn't support the scheme. The president should have said, no, you're opening a can of worms, a hornet's nest, but no, Pierce is weak, Pierce can be bullied, and Douglas forces him basically to say, okay, the administration will support this. And so Pierce basically caved into it, and as a consequence, most of the Northern Democrats in the Senate, and exactly half of the Northern Democrats in the House, uh, supported the bill, and that was just enough to get it through Congress. Anti-slavery groups in the North just want to preserve over this bill. They went ballistic. Among the outraged was a little-known politician from Illinois, Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was so angered by the blatant pro-slavery act that he helped create a radical new political party to oppose the expansion of slavery, the Republican Party. Previously, you talk about slavery now and then, but basically it's just been a fairly ordinary Whig politician. The Kansas Nebraska Act brings Lincoln back into politics, and it brings him into politics as a spokesman against the expansion of slavery. It galvanizes Lincoln. Meanwhile, in the Kansas Territory, anti- and pro-slavery settlers were literally fighting it out. On May 21st, 1856, pro-slavery forces burned the abolitionist stronghold of Lawrence, Kansas, down to the ground. The whole political situation begins to disintegrate, and Pierce is completely incapable of putting it back together again. Pierce failed to see his role in the deterioration of the Union. 
He genuinely thought he had a shot at a second term, but even his own party rejected him. The last line says, even his own party rejected him. So he does not want a second term. All right, so the video um, started talking about bleeding Kansas, we'll talk about in a second. So real quick guys, just for a review, which one is an 1820 agreement between the North and South that set the boundary of slavery at the southern border of Missouri and extended it west? That one is the Missouri Compromise. Allowed California to enter as a free state, but the US had to enforce the fugitive slave laws in the North. That was the Compromise of 1850. So then obviously the Kansas-Nebraska Act is the one that said Western territory should have popular sovereignty or the people will choose whether or not they want slavery. Um, this is the one that caused many problems in Kansas, which we're going to talk about right now. So although most people who actually lived in Kansas initially, way back um, when it was you know, hardly even a territory, actually didn't want slavery. So what ends up happening is a bunch of um, Southerners realize that this is going to become a free state and they don't want that. So they move in in large numbers, specifically people from Missouri, move into Kansas right, and um, vote for it to become a slave state. So what ends up happening is that you sort of have two different governments in one state, right? They're, they eventually turn violent. Um, both pro and anti-slavery forces fought, and then one would retaliate, and the next group would fight, and they retaliate. Kansas becomes an ideological battleground in the fight for slavery. Anti-slavery settlers in Kansas decided to form their own government, right, to counteract the original one. Both governments asked Congress for legitimacy. This ends up causing you know, fights to break out on the floor of the um, US Congress, right? It's a very messy kind of thing. Some people will even argue that the Civil War really begins out here in Kansas, right? Because it's um, pro-slavery, anti-slavery people fighting it out. The conflict was never really resolved until the Civil War actually begins and then ends. So it kind of, Kansas kind of is up in the air for a while throughout the, throughout the war. Okay, so the election of 1860. Two new political parties were formed that ran on anti-slavery agendas. There's the Free Soil Party and the newly formed Republican Party. Now at the time, guys, the Republican Party is a third party, right? It's very small. Um, it doesn't have any um, long history, right? It's brand new. But the new Republican Party nominated a little-known Westerner named Abraham Lincoln, who was very outspoken against slavery. Some people out west, Illinois, like that area, knew of him because he had those um, Lincoln-Douglas debates, right, that he became famous for but he didn't have a broad um, appeal across all of the states at the time. But the Democratic Party was now split between two candidates. So because the big party at the time was split, it allowed for Lincoln, this third party um, candidate, to actually win the election. Lincoln won every state from the North, right, which had a much larger population than the South. Um, although Lincoln claimed he wasn't going to end slavery, just contain it, the South basically didn't believe him. Okay, so they're afraid that now they're going to be outvoted in every presidential election. The president will always come from the North. Therefore, we will never have slave states, or oh, sorry, we'll, we'll never have new slave states ever again. Here's just a quick map. You can see um, the one Democratic candidate um, is in the, let's see, is in the uh, dark green, which is here and here and here. The light green is the other Democratic candidate. This orange is yet another political party. And Lincoln here is in the blue. So he pretty much solidly wins every uh, free state in the country, which is what allows him to become the 16th president. OK, what political party did Lincoln belong to when he ran for president? The Republican Party, the Democratic Party, or the Know Nothing Party? And the answer is the Republican Party. Um, and just so you know, guys, the Know Party is an actual political party that was around for a little while. Uh, let's see. South Carolina decides to secede or leave the nation on November 20th, 1860. They're later, they're later followed by six other southern states. Uh, let's see if I can get this. Let's see. There's Texas, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, and Georgia. They all decide to leave. Um, the Civil War was now pretty much unavoidable, right? You have these southern states forming the Confederate states. So now pretty much there's going to be a war. By the spring of 1861, four more states had left and joined the Confederacy. Uh, let's see, those ones would have been Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia. Uh, we'll talk more in class about this, guys, but this is the um, flag that most people consider to be the Confederate flag. It actually was more this flag. 
Um, this was a flag used by the Confederates, but the official Confederate flag was this one here. Okay, how many southern states voted for Lincoln in 1860? 10, 6, 3, or none? And the answer is none, not a single one. Which of the, well, what was the first state to secede from the United States? Was it North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, or Virginia? And the answer here is, um, sorry, is South Carolina, B. In total, how many states left the United States and formed the Confederate States of America? <coughs> And the answer this time is 11. Remember, there are 15 slave states, but four of them don't um, join the Confederacy. Four of the slave states actually stay in the Union. So there's 11 Confederate states. And here's just a final video about Lincoln, and then you'll be all set with your notes. Don't forget to do um, your margins, uh, main ideas, uh, keywords, uh, guiding questions or pictures, and that reflection, of course. Enjoy the video. Our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, like most beloved people, had a lot of nicknames. The Great Emancipator, the Rail Splitter, and Honest Day. But how about the Repairman? Because when our nation was badly broken, Abe Lincoln stepped in to fix it. There are two facts everyone knows about Abe Lincoln. He was born in a log cabin, and he was our tallest president. Although he became tall long after he left the log cabin. Few thought that this tall, awkward man would ever become president. If you look at him as a youngster, uh, you wouldn't would not predict that he would have done much to become another farmer, like his father, or gone further west and become a hunter. But he, he wanted to learn. Uh, he had ambitions. He had dreams. Lincoln educated himself and became a respected lawyer and public figure in Springfield, Illinois. Thankfully, this was in the mid-19th century, back when image wasn't everything. There's a lot of people who say Abe Lincoln couldn't win today. He was really tall and gangly and goofy looking. He actually had a terrible voice. He had a really high squeaky voice for a big guy. But while Abe Lincoln might not have had the most impressive voice, the words that he spoke in the 1850s, when the young Republican Party was leading the charge against slavery, commanded attention. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. What is stunning to me about Lincoln is the idea that he can hold that belief through four years of civil war. It, it's uh, that he, he doesn't turn back from it. He doesn't imagine there's some compromise. During his Senate run in 1858, Lincoln said some surprising things during a series of slavery debates with rival Stephen Douglas, like that slavery violated the natural rights of black people. Lincoln lost that Senate race, but won the Republican nomination for president. And as Lincoln became president, the divided nation split into all-out civil war. Lincoln was determined to hold the nation together. The reason we are one United States of America today is only because of Abraham Lincoln. A lesser leader would have allowed the South to go, maybe not even had that war. Lincoln was the best wartime president. He had one goal, to save the Union. He would do it by whatever tactic he needed. One of those tactics was to suspend habeas corpus, which essentially meant that an American could be tossed in jail and held without evidence in the name of protecting national security. Ensuring the civil liberties and the rights of the citizen is one of the giant tasks of any president during wartime. If you go back to Lincoln, uh, in a sense, he failed the test. He violated the Constitution. Thankfully, Abe proved he was back on the side of civil liberties by deciding to make good on that whole all men are created equal thing in the Declaration of Independence. In 1863, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation to end slavery in the United States. And Lincoln saves the Union and recreates the American story. Despite the fact that Lincoln was ambivalent about the question of slavery, and certainly deeply ambivalent about the question of uh, black equality. Our greatest president, I'm gonna be very cliche about this, was Abraham Lincoln. Because he brought us through the greatest of our uh, problems. Uh, the great divide in American history was the Civil War. And the great divide in American history was a black-white divide where whites were free and blacks were unfree. 
The South surrendered to the North in 1865, effectively ending the Civil War. But one of its last victims was Abe Lincoln. John Wilkes Booth's bullet may have ended the life of the great emancipator, but his words and deeds live on to this day. Government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth.